Thank you, Tina. That was such a great way to start because I think what I'm going to share with you all next, I think we really will build on what Tina's laying the groundwork. And I think just all of yesterday, trust was a theme that really came up so much. So I'm hopeful that what I share will reinforce a lot of the points we, we talked about, but also give you some more data and insight into what we've been hearing over the past year from um, people on the ground, the general public globally. Um, so again, I'm Courtney Grayhaupt. I'm with Edelman. Edelman, if you don't know us, we are a, a global communications and advisory firm. Um, but we've been studying trust for 23 years, um, and, and we release annual survey um, in January. I'm going to give you a little bit of that data, but really what I want to share with you is our special report we did, which is a subset of that, on health and trust. Um, and so, make sure I'm doing this. There we go. So we've been studying for 23 years. Every year we pull out a theme that comes out of the, the research. And the thing that was really clear this year was that polarization globally was the overarching theme. And so as we look at the data that we have, this really comes through again and again as we look at the declines in trust across all of the institutions that we survey, um, and also the economic pressures that are really coming into play. I mean, just to give you a quick snapshot, you know, while our global research that we do broadly on all topics in trust um, is across 28 countries, and usually covers about 33,000 respondents. Our, our health subset, the special report, um, was in 13 countries. We had about 1,000 respondents per country, and we tried with a smaller size to really make sure we were getting a broad sampling of countries globally so that we could give some, some really good feedback to everyone in terms of the insights we're pulling out from people. Um, and as we start, the place we really found is there are these four overarching themes that we found throughout the year that were really um, informing people's opinions in terms of their, their trust and really their day-to-day -day lives with the different institutions that we survey. Um, economic fears, understandably, are, the, are another overarching piece that really comes into play. And it's so interesting how, of course, this really does play across health. Um, polarization and how we're looking at that decline in trust I talked about with institutions, when you think about the people that uh, the general public looks at for information, this declining trust because of polarization that we're seeing is really seeping in and causing so many issues. And then the dispersion of authority. I'll talk to you about those voices, those stakeholders that people are really looking at. And clearly, yes, as we've been talking about, healthcare professionals are the number one most trusted source. But there's really interesting data on the rise of peers that we are seeing as a health expert in the minds of many people. And lastly, this empowered patient. Trust in the patient, it does mean they are looking for information, they are feeling more empowered, so they are out there searching for information. And as we keep talking about, it's so important that we're making sure we're providing them with the right accurate information to be looking at. So just to start, I'd love to come back to this theme on, on the economics that we're seeing. Every year we ask people, will you and your family be better off in five years? And the results this year were staggering. We had a 10-point decline, which is the biggest decline we've ever seen historically in how people were feeling. And you can see the double-digit declines in so many of these countries globally. And this sense that um, my, my future is not as strong as I want it to be really plays into people's impressions and what they are thinking about when they are looking at how hard it is to keep themselves and their families healthy in the current environment. It also plays into the institutions. So we look at four institutions, business, government, NGOs, and the media. And what we found this year were declines in all institutions. But interestingly, business is the only institution that is still seen in a trusted stance in this dark blue. NGOs, government, and media are all in neutral stance. And when you dig into different country-specific data, you see more. In the US, for instance, government and media squarely in the red, very distrusted. Um, and the business component here is very interesting. We'll dig in more about business and how that really plays in. It's the competence of business that we find that people, people feel NGOs may be more ethical, but not quite as competent as business can be to get things done. And getting things done is a theme that comes up to people as they are thinking about uh, the economic issues they're talking about. So this won't be a surprise to anybody. You know, higher income individuals are reporting that their overall health is better. Um, and obviously younger adults re report on this too. But it's really this 20 point drop that we saw between lower income people and high income individuals, regardless of age, that plays into, again, the data that we are seeing in terms of how healthy people feel and how hard it is for them to keep their families healthy. But we also wanted to ask people to think about the societal issues that are making them sick. And this was very interesting. The number one societal issue people felt that was making them sick was their, was their economy. So the inflation issue um, in pretty much every country was the number one response. 
The number two response were pandemic restrictions. So the isolation, the loneliness, the mental health issues and burnout that we've been seeing. Um, but interestingly, in the United States, the number two uh, reason was not pandemic restrictions. It was polarization, this polarization we heard about, which really did play into some of the plummeting uh, data that we saw with the US. Um, China was also a bit of an outlier. We saw the two biggest pieces there. Number one, um, burnout. And number two, lack of trust, which was very interesting to see that come up as a theme. Then we talked to people about the gap between how well they should be in, ter in terms of their health and how well they actually are in terms of their health. And again, we saw a 14 point um, increase in this gap of not being able to keep yourself as healthy as possible for all of these challenges and reasons that we're seeing. And again, these increases in just one year are really quite astonishing when we looked at the sort of trend that we, we just don't see these kinds of gaps and changes over one year typically. So again, we really do think those challenges we just saw on the previous slide are extremely acute at this moment in time. And then we dug in further about what are really those challenges that are keeping you from being healthy. And of course, cost is the number one issue. But information was number two and not that far behind when we looked at it. Lack of information, the changing health recommendations, Tina just talked about that a few minutes ago, and contradictory expert advice. And separately, we did a little research into this and found that understandably, people that have higher trust in the healthcare system will uh, be more trusting in those changing guidelines and be willing to accept sort of where that's going, um, but people with lower trust won't. And so these information gaps, there's a real opportunity while we're all working on closing the cost gap, we can make strides in closing the information gap perhaps more readily if we work together. So then I want to just switch gears and talk a little bit about how are people globally thinking about health and that definition. And we found that health truly is now defined in multidimensional ways. Four categories of health really are summarized in 66% of all respondents feeling that all four of these components make up their health. Mental health, physical health, but also social health and community livability. And when we talk about social health, we're really talking about, you know, as a person, may I speak freely? Am I respected in my community? Am I discriminated against? And with community livability, it's having a clean, safe planet and community to live in. And it's very interesting, too, to see that globally, mental health was the number one component of health, even more than physical health, which I think really plays into the conversations we're all coming to and having about mental health and well-being um, across all of the communities we work with. Interesting, with this wider definition of what health is, we also see a changing and broadening expectation from the public on who should be helping to take care of you and make you healthy. And so healthcare organizations clearly are the number one organization that need to have a meaningful role. But look at this data, food and beverage, yes, but technology, retail, financial services, and fashion and apparel. All of these organizations now, there is an expectation, you have an obligation to be working to make me and our community a healthier place. And even more astonishing is look at Gen Z, 18 to 34 year old on the bottom here, 62% versus 35 of adults 55 and older are feeling this way. So as we're looking at young adults and the next generation of leaders coming up, these expectations are even more acute. And so there's a really strong opportunity here for organizations well outside of healthcare to be taking a more active role because this is what their constituents, whether it's consumers or patients or others are asking for. We also looked at two different pieces. So one is, do I trust this institution in general to do what is right? And the good news is that healthcare as a whole, the entire sector of all of us together is still incredibly trusted. And also national health authorities are trusted. We hear about this so much, but there's trust there. However, when we asked people to think about these institutions, will they do what's right to help us address health-related needs and concerns? None of the institutions were trusted to do it except for my employer. And this is a fifth institution that we have started looking at because there's a lot of really interesting data. It's not all employers. It is my personal employer because trust is so local. I'm going to come back to this because the employer community, my employer, is a really undertapped uh, audience and channel for us to be thinking about how we're sharing information out against because it is that singularly trusted institution uh, with so many people. 
So now let's talk about, we talked about the institutions that are trusted or not trusted. Let's talk about the voices and individuals. But we start with how people get their information. When we looked at the media, trust in healthcare media specifically has just taken a nosedive. You know, we look at the seven point decline and in most, most of these countries, look at all of that red, that is distrusted territory. I do not trust healthcare media in general in so many of these places. And that really opens up the question then of, well, where are you getting in your information that you do trust? If it's not from these sources, is it's clearly coming from other places, and this is really something we need to get a handle on. So when we think then about who are the people, regardless of what channel they're showing up on, again, physicians um, and looking at nurses. And it's also, it's my doctor. So all doctors, yes, but specifically my personal doctor is the most trusted source. Nurses, of course, as well. But look at this third column. Family and friends has increased 11 points in being a trusted health expert. These are people saying, this is of the audience I want to get my information from on health, more than scientists, national health authorities, global health authorities, and on and on. This is something that I know makes us a little uncomfortable because this is not a expert voice, but people are turning to family and friends more than ever before. And so it's really important that we look at this in a way in terms of all of the communication and engagement activities that we are doing. Now, even more shocking perhaps than that is this data that we asked in terms of, you know, could you know as much as a doctor if you do your own research? We found that globally 44% of younger adults feel, 40% feel they can be as smart as a doctor just by doing their own research. When you look into specific countries, it's even higher. In the United States, it's 48, almost 50% of all Gen Zers and young adults feel this way. This is a bit of one of those moments that most of the rooms go, oh, but again, there's an opportunity here because they're not necessarily turning fully away from doctors. They just think they're on par if they do their own research. So again, this research, this information that they are doing is so critical because that's where they're starting. And lastly, we had also then looked at information and where people get it in terms of their vaccination status. I don't think this will be a surprise to the folks in this room, but just to reinforce, people that have been vaccinated who likely have higher trust in the system, the first places they've been turning to are my doctor, the recommendations of health authorities. For people that had not been vaccinated, internet searches were the number one way they were getting their health information and family and friends were number two. Number three, I didn't look at any information, and that's even more than talking to their doctor. So it's just really astonishing when we think about where people are going or not going to get this information. So with all of that, there certainly are places that we can turn to to build trust. So it's not all bad news, but when we think about it, there's a few places to start. And these are themes that I think we've all been talking about over the past you know, day and a half so far, but really thinking about communication strategies that help people with high and with low trust, given where they are right now in the system. People that have lower trust, because family and friends are that most trusted source, we need to be thinking about bringing that audience in in ways that we are making sure information is they're able to access but their most believable channel is my employer. They are gonna turn and listen to what their employer is sharing. So let's really think about how are we arming employers broadly, because employers are across all four of those institutions, not just business. How are we arming employers with the right kinds of information? Because that's a trusted place to start with. And then when it comes to the kinds of communication, what are the words, what are the approaches, what is the tone and message people need to have? They want to understand credentials from the people that are sharing information. Who are you and why should I trust you? Um, and they want to be able to ask questions. Don't shut them down. You need to engage in dialogue. We talked yesterday about one-on-one -on -one communication and just the opportunity to ask questions is so important. For those with higher trust, my doctor remains the most trusted source of information. National health authorities are where they want to get that information from. And, and, but people here too, don't use jargon. Give me clear, informative language that I can understand quickly and let me understand and then also uh, be able to ask questions as well. But more, it's, it's more about arming them with the information because they feel that they will understand it. They, we also got some really interesting input just in terms of how people are thinking about the ways they would like health experts to be engaging with them. You know, first of all, please include me in the science. More and more, there's an appetite for people. They, they've become more accustomed to reading and understanding things about science and medicine, but they want to understand that recommendations on data were related to people like them, and what does it mean for me? Secondly, show me how it fits into my life. I need to understand that, that whatever you're recommending really will be relatable and something I can action on. And lastly, give me a voice. 
let me ask questions, but also this is an opportunity to think about people who want to advocate for things, how we want to engage if people raise concerns, but also talk about what's working. And then lastly, two points that we looked at related specifically to vaccination in this cohort. So we did find, not surprisingly, but this to reconfirm, that people who are fully vaccinated really were those who had higher trust. So we see in the white bar folks that had high trust in the healthcare system and the dark bar people with low trust. So just again, to sort of paint that picture that regardless of what country and the different parts of the world we're looking at, this trend is just very strong again and again. 21 point differential globally when you look at that average. But the other piece is really the power of trust to mitigate for social disparities. And so if we think about people, even those lower income individuals that we knew from that earlier data that have uh, worse health outcomes and feel that they are not as healthy as they could be, when we found that when you looked at lower income, uh, income individuals that had high trust, trust mitigates that income differential because they had um, vaccination rates at an equal level of those with, with uh, higher income. So that trust perspective is so important when we're thinking about reaching people. Similarly, when the disparity was around poor and high quality of health care, people that had higher trust um, had that nine point increase. And we see this play out again when we surveyed on things like annual exams and preventive care. The same sort of metric comes up, high versus low. That trust differential really does negate and help people with, with health income and, and other disparities that we need to address. So lastly, just to think about sort of other places that there's opportunities for us to act, and I really want to come back to the employer question. So just one, one piece to map it out, you know, my employer is seen as competent and ethical well above all four of the other institutions. And so you just see in gray, the four institutions we survey plotted out on this bar of competence and ethic. And you see business is seen as more competent, maybe slightly less ethical than, than uh, NGOs, media and government way over here on the left. But my employer sits so strongly in that place for employees of being both ethical and competent and a voice people trust. And so this just really, to paint the picture of where we can go in terms of a voice that is undertapped, that has um, this trust already built in. When we talk to people about things that organizations can do to build trust, but also the things that there is now an expectation that you will be doing to improve the health of people broadly, four things really rose to the top. And the number one uh, response was providing trustworthy health information. Secondly, addressing climate and inequality and other issues like that. Third, improving the health of the local community, bringing it back to me and my community locally. And then lastly, Convening stakeholders, and I love the fourth one because it really speaks to the need for partnership and the power and expectation we see from the general public that you are not doing it on your own. They want to see you engaging with others and really acting together. And then just very last, last point, you know, we talked about the mental health, so just to come home, there is an expectation, not surprisingly from people, that CEOs and leaders and organizations are doing more than just talking about mental health and burnout and your well-being beyond your physical health. There's an expectation that you must talk about it, but you must model it. And also that burnout becomes such an issue that there is an expectation with health that employers must be looking at burnout. And I would say this can come back as we're thinking about those holistic health conversations that we're thinking through. So four thoughts that I'd like to leave you with in terms of what we can do um, to really improve health. I mean, obviously addressing health inequalities is something that I know is table stakes for this group, but I think as we talk broadly to organizations globally, really reinforcing the role that organizations outside of healthcare have a responsibility in this area as well. Two, the dispersion of authority, really thinking about the rise of family and friends and peers. How are we bringing that together in concert with healthcare professionals and other key voices to be thinking about um, sharing the right kinds of information and building trust in the system broadly? Third, the power of local. We need to be thinking about how we are driving better health outcomes by using those voices at the local level, by bringing in data that shows the impact to the local level, and by bringing together all of those stakeholders that we need to. And lastly, the role of advocating for the truth. And this is really where employers can be part of this. There's an untapped resource of talking to these employers, as I mentioned, to be a source of reliable information. Partnering, sharing the information that all of you are putting out to make sure that we're putting this into the hands of the public in a way that they will really understand and correcting misinformation when it is there. So that was my speed round. There's a lot more data I'd love to talk to you all about as well. Um, but thank you so much, and I'd love any questions that you might have.